The question of the week from last week. Should a fool who doesn't listen still be disciplined? We talked about this, but I still wanted to hear your guys' view and how it applied to different things like the workplace and the church and that kind of different stuff. Any ideas, guys? I keep going back and forth. Go ahead. Elaborate. Well, for one, like, you know, Proverbs says how, you know, basically, don't don't waste your, uh, you know, like, don't, not, not Proverbs, I think like Matthew or something says, don't throw your pearls to the swine. So, you know. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verse, um, uh, I think, 5. But then, again, it's like, well, if you do tell them, they may not listen now, but, you know, it's in their heads, maybe they'll learn from later on. Okay. Maybe, you know, kind of like kids, they don't really listen now, but when they get adults, they kind of start understanding what, you know, they were taught when they were kids, and they start doing some changes in their life. Okay, what about on social media, for instance? Oh, you mean, well, it can go both ways, you know what I mean? Like, um... Okay. Some people I've seen that it's actually changed their view by talking it over with them. But then others, it's just like they're so hard-headed that no matter what you say, they, they just don't want to change their point of view. Do you think that there's any better effect talking to people in person over online? Or do you think that they're not going to listen They're not gonna listen either way? Um, I think it depends on the person. Okay. Some people like to read it over and over again and kind of mull through it, you know, and under, try to understand. Um, so online's better, especially since, like, a lot of people are shy and they kind of just close close up if someone's talking to them oh, in person, gotcha. you know? Uh-huh. Um, but other people, they're real, real relational, and when you talk to them in person, they hear you out. When they're reading it on a page, they just kind of skip over it. Okay. You know? Anybody else have ideas? Oh, I um, should a fool who doesn't uh, listen still be disciplined? What do you guys think? Or what do you think about what Gracie was saying? I kind of agree with what Gracie says. You agree? Okay. Do you care to elaborate anymore? Or mm, not really? No, just, it depends on the person <laughs> and... <laughs> what they're going through, plus their uh, boredom. Back up, you said what they're going through? What do you mean? Yeah. Uh, what kind of day they're having, what kind of, you know, mentally... Are you talking about the person who's talking, or the one who's who's being disciplined? Who's, who's being disciplined. Oh, okay. Yeah. I gotcha. Okay. Honestly, I think... If they're not going to listen, I don't really think you should be wasting your breath on it. Okay. We're wasting your time because it's like, you can explain it to them a million times, and they're still not going to listen. Okay. All right. Were you going to weigh in on this? No? Anybody else want to add, or any thoughts you guys had? I think for me, it's just hard to give up on somebody. Unless it's like repeated over and over and over and over. Uh, pause. Uh, I didn't say uh, give up on somebody. I just said discipline them or not. Right. And to me, like if you don't discipline them, kind of give up on them. Right. Well, I'm not gonna agree or disagree. I'm just saying I don't think that the two should be equated as one. You know what I mean? Sometimes, for instance, um, what's a good example? Sometimes, for instance, there's someone at the church, not someone, I mean people. I'm not pointing out one specific, I'm saying there's people at the church, for instance, who are doing something uh, stupid, for instance, and I just kind of hold my tongue on it, you know, because it just seems like it's not the opportune time. Not because I'm not giving up on the person, okay, just because it just doesn't seem like it's, or some things just work themselves out. Like, I see a lot of uh, depressed people who say really, really stupid things. Because they're de- depressed. P- the people, people who are depressed say stupid things. Right. Well, you can either sit there arguing with them about, uh, about how the stupid things that they're saying aren't true, or you can just let it go and try to encourage them. Yeah, I see what you're saying. That doesn't mean I'm giving up on them. Now, I'm not saying, once again, I'm not saying that your view is right or my view is right. 
I'm just saying I don't necessarily think that the two should be equated as, as equals. Any other other ideas? We're good? You guys come up with anything with it? No, okay. And is he does something like raises his hand or something, you guys are gonna have to tell me because I'm not gonna keep with him. Right. I feel like I'm in one of those Greek theaters, you know, where they had people behind them and all around and everything. <laughs> That's the Coliseum. Right. Are you not entertained? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Okay. So, Proverbs 21. We almost are, I almost considered doing three chapters tonight. Because at the end of chapter 22, there's like this this part that's connected, and you can go through them a lot faster. And then I was like, no, because it's okay if we end a little bit early. <laughs> okay. uh, 21 verse 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Now, I want to say a few things. First off, God doesn't condone everything that a leader does. Okay, I feel like sometimes that is... Uh, People take this to say, so Hitler's actions were condoned by God. No, 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 no. God places people in authority, but he doesn't condone everything that they do. Okay, He, he ultimately stays in control, even though wicked people still... So um, a great example of this, King Saul. God appointed him, anointed him as king over Israel, and he messed up and he lost his place as, as, the, as, the king, as having the kingdom. Um... So there, there's that. Uh, Hitler, uh, you know, God allowed him to rise to a place of, of power, but however, he misused that power because his, obviously his intentions were evil. And uh, so he ended up, in the end, things just didn't go very well. Um, so the idea here isn't necessarily that God condones everything they do, but that he has final authority over the situation. And uh, I also want to say that these kinds of things uh, kind of connect, so I'll go ahead and mention them too. God can bring his purposes even through unrighteous leaders. We see this especially, and Ben and I were actually just talking about this, we see this perfectly shown in the book of Exodus, where God only ever has Moses ask for three days' journey in the wilderness. He never asks, asks to let Israel go. He doesn't ask that. He just says, let, them, let my people go for three days into the desert. But after the tenth plague, Pharaoh tells Moses, just get out, completely leave, go. He kicks him out completely because his son just died, and as well as all the people, all the children, all the firstborns of Egypt had died. See what I mean? <laughs> After the other nine plagues, too. Right. Uh, so, that's what God wanted all along, but he didn't ask Pharaoh for that. And Pharaoh, in the end, gave him the exact thing that he already wanted. See what I mean? God has a way of, of God can bring his purposes. Don't worry about, oh, but this person's evil. God can bring about his purposes. We don't need to be concerned. Let, let me reword that. We do need to be concerned about stuff. We need to pray about stuff, absolutely. But we don't need to be worrisome or troubled in our hearts. See what I mean? Like, if Hillary Clinton was elected, it's all right. God's still in control. If you were not a Trump supporter, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I'm not really a Trump supporter either, so we're all... We're all in, I like him more than Clinton, but I mean, that's, that's like comparing crap to... A bigger pile of crap, so I don't know. I feel like that doesn't fit. Anyways, now, and then lastly, prayer does change things, okay? So those things kind of are affected by this. I just want to clarify that since this part talks about that. Verse 2, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord's way is the heart. This is one that's been repeated a couple of times, just in different ways. To do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. That one kind of hits hard, um... I grew up in kind of a, the religious environment where you had to, had to uh, you know, sacri you had to worship God, and that was like, you know. But this actually tips the scale on, on the whole religion thing. It's it's better to do righteousness and justice to, to treat people how God wants them to be treated than it is to offer God sacrifices. This would be like, oh, but God, I, I give you a tenth of all my finances. I I seek you every day. I pray. I, I pray. God desires that you do good things more so. Than that you give those things up for God. That's a big statement. Verse 4, Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the lamp of the wicked are sin. Now this one ha it, it has a little bit confusing, 
And some different translations are going to say some things. Um, if you have an NIV, for instance, it's going to say, Haughty eyes and a proud heart. Uh, the tillage, uh, or the, um, what's the word? Uh, uh, plowing of the wicked or sin. And then if you have something like an ESV, and I think the NASB does too, um, Haughty eyes or a proud heart. The lamp of the wicked are sin. Okay, so, and then some of them say is sin. Yeah. And the idea here, without getting too lost amongst the different <laughs> ways it can be translated, <laughs> is that uh, being proud, being proud is um, being proud is, is is evil. That's basically the idea of it. Um, there's more nuances there, you know. And he's more talking about not not being proud of somebody having a prideful spirit. We talked about this a couple uh, months ago, so I don't really need to go into that. Um, and some of them read differently. Um, I think the ESV has a little bit of a brookish reading. It sounds a little bit too. Um, uh, there's uh, one of them that I read was real fluid. Um, um, it said something. Like, if I can remember, it said something like, um, "Haughty eyes and a proud heart." Um, all the all the works of, of the wicked are sin, or something like that. It, I, I really prefer that translation, even though it was less um, precise. It, it didn't really wasn't an exact translation because it just made it flow better and it was easier to understand. Anyways, verse five: the plan, uh, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. Now, if you notice here. Um, in the first part, he's talking about the diligent. That's the person who, you know, the the person who handles things wisely, the the hard worker. The plans of that diligent person lead surely to abundance because they steadily and, and continually persevere in their hard work. But then, everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. They're too quick in their decisions. They make a decision too quick. They give up on it too quick. And so, notice how the diligent, hardworking person is contrasted with the person who just real rashly makes decisions. So. Um, everyone who's hasty comes only to poverty. The idea is if you really want to um, do well in something, you have to be diligent, you have to work hard, and you have to stay with it. That's the idea of it. And also, uh, it kind of implies that you should probably think it through, too. <laughs> right. uh, verse 6, The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a fleeting vapor and a snare of death. And that one is kind of self-explanatory there. Um, yeah, I mean, did anybody not understand the proverb? I can break it down if... Well, I'll just go ahead. And, um, the idea is that when you lie to get things, it's not going to be a lasting, a lasting. Um, yeah. What's it called? A lasting blessing. Okay. For instance, let's say you're in court and and you lie about lie to get you know immoral, an immoral thing done. You know, it's not going to be something that lasts. If you lie to get money, if you lie, it's just not going to be something that brings about. Right. The violence of the wicked will sweep them away because they refuse to do what is just. The idea of karma is oftentimes brought up with people. And did you know that the majority of the population believes in karma? Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Christianity actually doesn't teach karma. I know this is crazy for a lot of Christians. They say, what? And I've talked about this before. Karma is this. You are building up into a, into an a, a, um, an account, a, a, account a, a universal clock, basically, right? right? And when you, or scales, I should say, I think are more precise. Uh, and when you do good things, the universe literally um, brings good blessings and good, um, good uh, not ambiance, but good uh, good thoughts your way. And, right. You know, that kind, of, that kind of thing. And when you do negative, it negatively affects the, the universe, and the universe then will, 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 trans, will bring about transgression. And then your accumulated good and bad jujus will come back to you in, the, in your next life and how would you come back as, that kind of stuff. Okay? Um, so you're always trying to achieve righteousness. So if you actually think about it, what karma actually is, I don't think people, a whole lot of people actually believe in karma. They think that they believe in karma. Mm -hmm. What they actually believe in they, is they believe in consequences. Mm -hmm. When you do bad things to people, oftentimes you'll find people doing bad things to you. This guy's a jerk boss. Should we give him mercy? No, he's a jerk. Well, that's not karma. But people don't really understand the thing that they think that they believe in. Anyways, um... Verse 8, the way of the guilty is crooked, but the conduct of the pure is upright. The way of the guilty is crooked, but the conduct of the pure is upright. Verse 9, it is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> and uh, once again, I want to bring this up. 
it's not just about the wife. Okay, this is also, I mean, if it's true for the wife, it's true for the husband too. If you're a quarrelsome husband, I mean, that's the same idea here. The only thing is that Proverbs is written primarily because of, I don't really want to get too much into it, but at the time, Proverbs was written primarily with the idea of a, of a man in mind. So when it says these few little things like this about the women, that's like the few things it has to say about a woman. Like people, a lot, a lot of feminists get mad because of the one chapter that talks about the wife of good character. After the rest of the book just talked about a husband of good character, <laughs> right. you know. So let's put things in perspective here. That right. Proverbs isn't isn't a feminist. It was just written in a certain culture. Uh -huh. That culture is not really around today. Right. So can you as a, as a woman get the same message that a man can nowadays? Yes, right. absolutely. Because the world the world has changed, and so as a result, women have become more you know I don't know what the word is uh, liberated I guess. And so as a result, they have a more uh, primary role in our culture than they did back then. So a lot of the messages, you know, just go right over. So then the same is true vice versa. Is it right then for a man to be quarrelsome if a woman shouldn't be? Well, no. So once again, though, um, Proverbs also does things, says things in such a way that it's not trying to be, <laughs> trying to be. So that was the baby, okay, guys. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not trying to be. <laughs> uh, that, it's not trying to be sexist. It's just the way it was written. Like he'll say. Um, a foolish son will 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 uh, do harm to his father, and his mother will be driven away. Or yeah, yeah. that doesn't actually say that, but you roll with me here. Right. The idea isn't that some things will only happen to the father, and some other things will only happen to the mother. The idea is that a foolish son will bring bad effects onto his household. That's the idea. Does that make sense? So once again, things just kind of get lost. I think sometimes when when you look at it now, as though it was written nowadays when it wasn't. It was written a long time ago. Um, just to kind of put things in perspective, Proverbs was written around the 900s BC. BC. Okay, we're talking about 2,900 years ago. That's like 3,000 years ago, guys. Literature's changed. <laughs> and so as a result, you can't look at the Bible and say, well, if I was reading it nowadays, if I was writing it nowadays, you have to say, okay, what did it mean back then? And then just kind of draw the principle forward through. So... Uh, 10. The soul of the wicked... I'm sorry, I didn't go over my note there. Character is most important. That's the idea there. You can get a, a wife that's the most gorgeous in all the land. You can get a wife that's the best cook in all the land. But at the end of the day, is she a quarrelsome woman? So. <laughs> the soul of the wicked desires evil. His neighbor finds no mercy in his eyes. This one kind of hit me pretty hard, guys. And I'm, I'm being real right now. Um... The soul of the wicked desires evil. Have you ever had somebody do something and you desired evil for them? His neighbor finds no mercy in his eyes. Have you ever reached that place where you, where you didn't want to give people mercy? Uh, yeah, that's why it hit so close to me too. Verse 11, when a scoffer is punished, the simple becomes wise. Again, this was from, we looked at this last week in chapter 19, uh, I think verse 25. Again, here it is again. When a scoffer is punished, the simple becomes wise. When a wise man is instructed, he gains knowledge. So we have three people again. The scoffer being punished for the sake of the simple. And then the wise get wiser anyways. No matter what happens, they get wiser. So, I mean, just really interesting um, Interesting thing. Now, remember I asked that question at the beginning of the lesson. Proverbs are not always true in every single situation. They're principles generally true and proven true. Okay? They're not commands. They're principles proven true over time. So, verse 12. The righteous one observes the house of the wicked. He throws the wicked down to ruin. Now, this one is another one that's very tricky. It could be saying the righteous one is in God. Okay? Uh, observes the house of the wicked, he keeps guard on what they do, and then he throws them, throws them down to ruin. Okay, That's simple enough, um, but it really doesn't seem to fit with the rest of Proverbs, which has caused a lot of commentators to say, well, that just can't be right. Which leads to a second um, way that it could technically be translated, and, and it could be translated either way, just like Gracie's breeze. <laughs> um, it could be something like this, a righteous person or a righteous, a righteous man um, observes the house of the wicked, and he throws down uh, um, the wicked down. And in other words, um, like a judge, for instance, who steps up and does what is right and what is just in the situation, um, keeping keeping careful watch not to do the same thing. He keeps watch on the house of the wicked. Okay, could be translated either way. Um, when, as one of those one of the situations, well, just kind of leave you guys to ponder. 
Verse 13, whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. Um, keep in mind that he's not just talking about the poor, he's talking about the despised in, in, in culture. Um, nowadays it would be the drug addict. Yeah. If a drug, drug addict calls out for help and there's no one to help him, and that person also will not be. Okay. Um, uh, back then it was widows and orphans, uh, the poor, that kind of thing. But really the idea is someone who can't get help and you then ignore them when you have the opportunity to do something good. And the idea of it is, is, is even more simple than that. You shouldn't keep yourself from doing something that's righteous. If you have the ability to do so, you know, so. Uh, okay, so that takes us to verse uh, 14, I believe. Yes. A gift in secret averts anger and a concealed bribe strong wrath. Now here's another one that the Bible doesn't necessarily condone. It's just recording. Uh, oh yes, so the idea here um, is that when, when you give someone, when things are when things have gotten tense and you kind of try to smooth it over with gifts, it often tense will go well. Um, he's not talking about the morality of the thing. Um, however, if you remember, we talked about the the spouse of the cheater and how gifts many gifts wouldn't wouldn't uh, avert their anger. Right. So that's why I said contrast that with the spouse uh, of the cheater. So. Verse 15, when justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. Once again, when, when justice is brought out, it, it affects other people. It's just a, a way of life. Um, verse 16, one who wanders from the way... And also, the, the, the opposite is true, also. When injustice is done, evildoers rise up more and more because there's no, there's no checks for them. And uh, it, it becomes a terror to the just, to the righteous people. And you find them, it's not that they've necessarily disappeared, but they've withdrawn, and then over time, it can negatively affect them to where they uh, feel as though their, their plight for righteousness is, is pointless. Um, one who wanders from the way of good sense will rest in the assembly of the dead. This is, once again, what we were talking about a couple weeks ago, about how if you stop seeking after righteousness and, and, and wisdom, how it just, you find yourself going away from it. You can't not actively be pursuing wisdom and still be wise. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. And once again, the idea here is not necessarily that you have to abstain from everything fun. That's not the idea here at all. He's saying moderation. Right. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. Uh, he who loves wine and oil will, be not, will not be rich. So you're saying oil is a sin now? See, that's not what he's saying at all. He's saying when you get when you give yourself over to the, to the pleasures and you, you're not. He's trying to contrast really two characters: the diligent person who's wise with what they have, they work hard and they're very careful whenever they spend money. They don't just put it on the credit card. I'll worry about it later. They're they're wise with what they do. But then, in contrast to that, there's this other person who's just kind of kind of a moron <laughs> with how how they handle things. And uh, where was that verse? I want to kind of read it in context there. So whoever loves the pleasure, you know, whoever, it, it's a thing, your life revolves around it. Have you ever seen people who love video games? <laughs> they have literally every video game released, they're on it 24-7. I mean, they don't have a life apart from video games. Right. He who loves Playstations will find himself without friends, for instance. That would be a <laughs> modern right problem. Online. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but you get what I'm saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. the idea of, of, of moderation versus, you know, um, and in fact, and it's like sodas are another great example. There's nothing wrong with sodas. But when you have sodas all the time, it negatively affects your health. I mean, that's just a bad thing. You find yourself yeah. tired all the time. You, you're mm -hmm. more open to have diabetes and that kind of stuff. Uh, man, oh man, some of these things, man, guys, like, if you read some of the things about what they're saying about diet sodas now, if it's true, it's awful yeah. scary. We're talking about screwing up your life forever. So anyways, um, verse 18 and oh, one, one more thing there. Notice how it says, will not be rich. You see a lot of people who, they don't want to be poor. They don't want to continually, you know, live in the same boat that they always have lived in. But at the same time, they don't want to stop wasting their money on things like, well, I'm a smoker. It's like, well, yeah, but do you want to buy your cigarettes or do you want to have a better life? So, I mean, like, you have to have some, some balance there. So, anyways, verse 18, the wicked is a ransom for the righteous and the traitor for the upright. This is another one that has multiple translations, so let's look at them. 
There it is. Um, and the one, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say which one I'm siding with, okay? Basically, he's saying that um, what evil people anticipate for good people comes back on them. The wicked is a ransom for the righteous. Okay, in other words, um, they they were wicked, they were trying to find something, but it only ransomed the righteous in the sense of it, it yeah, they turned back on them. Um, once again, though, <laughs> the reading is very ambiguous. And in fact, one one commentator that I was reading, which, which just said, it's impossible to know it. <laughs> Normally, you go back at the ancient text, you know, um, the Septuagint, for instance, and you'd at least be able to get some kind of clarity, but they're divided on it. Wow. And so it's like, well, I, I don't know what to do next here, guys. Um, the, some alternate readings, though, if I can remember any of them, is that... Um, Oh, how did that... There was another really popular one, if I can remember how it was. Um, oh, yes. Uh, the wicked is a ransom for the righteous in the sense of uh, righteous people suffer for uh, other people's uh, wrongdoings. Um, then there was another reading. Uh, actually, that's all the ones that I can remember. But there's about, like, 20 different understandings of this verse because they don't really know how to translate it in the Hebrew. <laughs> Translations are hard, guys, and Hebrew is even harder than it is in the New Testament. Right. Greek, that's what, that's what I know. In my opinion, Greek's one of the easiest languages that there are. I mean, it just makes sense. I understand it better than English. But Hebrew, on the other hand, I mean, the whole thing's backwards. Literally, the whole thing's backwards. They read right to left. It's, it's gross, guys. It's a gross language. <laughs> but anyways, I don't really understand it um, very well, and, and so I couldn't really give my two cents on it. I just have to go on what everybody else is saying on it. If somebody else knows Hebrew, you're welcome to try to argue over this verse as much as you as you want. Um, again, in verse 19, we have a quarrelsome wife. It is better to live in a desert land than with, with a quarrelsome and fretful wo woman. I was reading this book called Waking the Dead, and, and the writer, John Eldridge, mentioned about... Um, how he, him and his wife uh, were so tired at this one point that they, that they were talking about just building a shack out in the, um, what's that, uh, not the Sahara, that big desert with all the dunes, um, just reaches for miles and miles and miles. Um, what? Maybe that was it. Gobi? Maybe. That sounds familiar. Anyways, not important. Let's just say the Sahara. Who cares? He's not, it's not like John Eldridge is going to listen to my notes and be like, okay, well, that wasn't the desert I said. I mean, come on. <laughs> Anyways. Um, and how they want to just build a build a shack out out in the out in the middle of the dunes of the desert, wow. uh, and that would be their 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 place of of, of rest. <laughs> oh wow. my gosh! Um, and, and it just made me think of that because he says it is better to live in a desert land than with a cross from a fretful woman. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, precious uh, treasure and oil are in a wise man's dwelling, but a foolish man devours it. Um, once again, we've looked at this a hundred times before. Uh, but the idea about wise people and how they handle stuff versus the fool and how they don't know how to handle stuff. They don't they don't know what to do with money when they have it. They don't know what to do with riches when they have it. They don't know what to do with, with wisdom when they have it. Foolish people don't know what to do with stuff. And rather than asking for, for some kind of help or input or anything, they'd rather just perish in their foolishness. So verse 21, Whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. Verse 22, a wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. And this one's a lot more simple than it seems. All that he's saying is wisdom is better than might. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they, they trust. I'll give you an example. Let's say that there's this man who has this mighty army who's in a fight with this other guy that's just a great, a great tactician. He just understands the, the principles of how people act. They get in, they get in a war together, and the wise man ends up ends up cornering this this guy that had all these strong forces into one city, and then he's able to effectively overthrow the entire city because of, of his of his of his skill in, in combat, his understanding. You see what I'm saying? His understanding of, of the battlefield and and his good tact and and forming a plan of attack. Where um, a wise man scales the city of the mighty. Wisdom is better than great might. You can think things through. You can figure things out. You can you can avoid problems. And brings down the stronghold in which he trusts. Verse 23, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. That one's pretty simple. Shut up. <laughs> Basically it. Verse 24, scoffer is the name of the arrogant, haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. 
I just thought that was funny. He says arrogance like four times. The arrogant man who actually arrogance. <laughs> Got it, Solomon. <laughs> uh, the desire of the sluggard kills him, for the hand for his hands refuse to labor. The desire of the sluggard kills him because he refuses to work for it. How many people have you seen on the side of the road, perfectly healthy, drinking alcohol, but not able to work? Desire is killing them. So, uh, verse 26, All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. Righteous people are mark marked by their care for others. Foolish people and wicked people are marked for their care for themselves. What do you spend your money on? What do you spend your time on? What do you... Is it all about you? Is everything about you? Do you only think about you? Do you dream about you? Do you do everything that pleases you? If your life revolves around you, you might not be that righteous of a person. <laughs> the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he brings it with evil intent? So basically what he's saying is, is if you're a wicked person, your sacrifices are not pleasing to God. Even more so if you're bringing them with false intent. Like for instance, surely if I fast, God will give me what I want. Evil intent. So, that brings up a very important point that is found all over in the books of the law, for instance, Leviticus. We can't earn God's good graces. Verse 28, a false witness uh, will perish, but the word of a man who hears will endure. And this one could be translated in multiple ways as well. This chapter was just very hard <laughs> to find. Part. It just had multiple verses that were, that were hard to understand. So there's two basic understand, understandings here. The first is a man who hears is, is a truthful witness. In other words, um, where is it? A false witness will perish, but a, a, a good witness, he will endure through the testimony. Though As they're going back and forth, the prosecution or whatever will be able to pick out the words of a false witness, but they won't be able to of a, of a true witness because it's truth. But that didn't really seem to flow with what it was saying here, and so I kind of I agreed with this other one. Um, a man who's being accused will overcome the false witnesses because he's got the true... So, see what I mean? So, in that sense, a false witness it will perish, but the word of a man who hears will endure. If he just pays attention and keeps his head, keeps a, le keeps a level mind, he can, he can get through it. See what I mean? Because he's got truth on his side. Um, and that just seemed to make more sense. Uh, but then there was a third reading. Uh, let me think if I can remember how it went. Um, it was so unlikely that I didn't put it down, but I guess it, I should have put it just in case, you know. Just because something's unlikely doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Oh yeah, it had something to do with a false witness versus someone who had nothing to do with a, a court or anything like that. It was just like this person out there. I forgot how they connected it, like, but it didn't really make sense because he was obviously talking about a witness and then the, the commentary, commentator made it sound like it was about something completely different. Yeah. Like he was contra contrasting apples and oranges. Huh. And it just didn't make sense. So I didn't write it down and I can't remember how he said it, so I'm just going to skip on. Verse 29. A wicked man puts on a bold face, but the upright gives thought to his ways. See, an upright person carefully considers things and, and doesn't have to put on a bold face because he, he keeps his way from doing that. But on the other hand, a wicked person, he has to put on a bold face and pretend like, okay, I got this, I got my crap together, I got this under control, when he doesn't, because he didn't think out his ways. Right. Verse 30, no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel can avail against the Lord. And the verse 31 goes hand in hand with that one. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. In other words, if there is someone that God has his heart set on losing a battle, they will not win the, win the war. That's just how it's going to go. Um, and then I really like this part on verse 30. No wisdom, no understanding, and no counsel can avail against the Lord. Ultimately, remember, the Lord has to be the basis of wisdom, the basis of understanding, the basis of counsel. If you're getting counsel from people who aren't godly, if you're getting counsel from things that, you know, from foolishness, see what I mean? It's just not going to... It's not going to fit. And so in that sense, I guess it's kind of a uh, contradiction here. Because it can't be wisdom and understanding and counsel if it's contrary to God. So if it's opposed to God, see what I mean? Kind of asks, it kind of begs the question, so is it actually counsel? Is it actually wisdom? So, 
Says to Proverbs 22. <clears throat> a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver or gold. Now, he might be alluding here to bribes. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Don't be allow yourself to be paid off. Right. Might be. It's a little vague, and so I'm just posing it as a question. You can notice the question mark on the PowerPoint. <laughs> Uh, the rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. And the NIV says something along like the, the lines of this. The rich and the poor um, have this in common. Uh, the Lord is the maker of them both. But it doesn't seem to be saying that. It seems to be saying the rich and the poor meet together. They they um, they dwell in the same areas. Right. You know what I mean? We have rich people and poor people, they're in the same they're in the same cities, the same, in the same places and whatnot. But the Lord is the maker of them all. So... Um, they rub shoulders, if you will. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. See, the prudent is careful to keep himself from that. Verse 4, the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Verse 5, thorns and snares are in the way of the crooked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far from them. In other words, crooked people lead themselves down places where they're going to hit problem after problem, but a, a wise person is going to not have those same problems and difficulties in their life because they're not going to do that. They're going to keep themselves from it, so they won't have to deal with those thorns. Now, that's not to say that they will never have problems, but those problems they won't have. Does that make sense? Right. Awesome. Verse 26. Uh, like, for instance, let's say there was um, a, a wise person who was very careful with his money. He's not going to have the same struggles as the poor person who was not careful with his money. Because he was careful with his money, he kept himself from the problem. <laughs> so, verse uh, 6. I'm, I'm wondering if I should mention something else about verse uh, 4. Yeah, I will. In verse 4, he said the reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor in life. Remember, not everybody who does the right thing is always going to become rich on this earth. It's not also not a promise of wealth and great riches on this earth. That's not what it's promising. I'm just saying, typically, when you don't waste your life on those evil things like, you know, drugs and whatnot, you're not going to... Your reward will be... Have you ever... Let me put it in a... Have you, have you ever had a college friend that said, hey, let's go get hammered? And you say, no, I'd rather not. Well, what's your reward going to be? A, even though you may have may be losing friends and you may feel alone and everything, your reward will be in and of itself. You'll have you'll have your money that you didn't blow. You'll have your wits which you didn't blow. So I mean, the reward is in and of itself. That kind of makes sense. He's not promising that that just because you did the right thing will you turn up you know on top of things. Um, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, this is probably the most, or on the top ten most raped verses of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Alongside a side of, do not judge, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, yeah. and ones like that. So let's look at what it's actually saying. First off, did it say anywhere in there that if you teach your child your religion, that they will always be the same religion as you? It, it didn't say that in there? Oh, well, then what did it say? Train up a child in the way he should go. Well, my child should go following Christ. Yes, I, I totally agree that, 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 that following God is, is a good thing. Absolutely. But that's not what he's talking about here. <laughs> you see what I mean? So, what is he talking about? Boop! Not a promise about spiritual development. Discipline and life guidance. If you teach your child about life skills, like making food, if you teach them how to be honest, if you teach them these things, yeah. generally speaking, they're going to stick with it throughout their life. They're going right. to know. Like, for instance, I have something called common sense because my parents worked diligently to work it into me. Then I had to deal with some of the kids in the Oasis, and I think, you have no common sense. And I, and I get frustrated, and I think, hey, this kid's an idiot. But then I just I stop and think, ah! Wait, he didn't grow up in the same household that I did. See what I mean? And that's kind of kind of what I'm what I'm getting at here. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and he's older, he will not depart from it. Those things, those principles, they get rooted in our um, in our in our minds and, and in our in our character. And uh, we we do the same things without even realizing it. You know what I mean? Um. Since I've been married, I've had a
very hard time with the idea of a husband going shopping with the wife. I don't know why it makes me feel uncomfortable. I don't know what to do. I feel awkward. I, I don't know. I also have a hard time with, with, with public displays of affection. I don't know. Well, then you look at my parents, and they don't do public displays of affection, A, and, 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 and B, my dad never shops, or at least when I was a kid. And he Now he occasionally does, but my dad never shopped with my mom. So, I mean, it, it, it stuck with me throughout the years. And that's a bad example, but it's an example nevertheless. The things that, 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 that we teach our kids, they ha it has a way of sticking with them. So, once again, this is not a problem about spiritual development. However, the books of the law do clarify that it is our responsibility as parents to train our children in righteousness, to tell them about the things that God has done in our lives, to tell them about the good things and the good blessings, and to give credit for what, to God for what he's done in our lives. The, Bible, the books of the law do say that, but Proverbs doesn't say that here. You understand the difference? Just because it's a, it's a how did I say it last week, guys? Just because it's a true statement doesn't mean it's a right statement. Right. Okay, like the friend being Jesus in, in Proverbs. Yes, Jesus is a friend that's exclusive to than a brother, but that's not what that's not what Proverbs was talking about. It's a true statement, it's just not the right statement from what Proverbs is actually saying. And if we truly want to understand the Bible, we have to start with what is it saying? So that takes us to verse seven, I guess. Uh, the rich rules over the poor. And the borrower is the slave of the lender. And you might think, how can taking out loans make me a, a slave to somebody? If you miss a payment, what's going to happen to that thing? You're going to take it away. You are a slave to it. They can confiscate your car, for instance. They can confiscate. They can kick you out of your house when, when you don't. When you don't follow it, you're, yeah. So whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of his fury will fell. Um, his plans, they won't work out. You know, he, he might go and, and try to... He, he won't do something right, and then when it doesn't work out right, even though he tries to, to rage and get all angry, but it's not going to bring anything about, because it, 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 it's, whoever sows injustice will reap calamity. That's just the end effect of it. There's, there's no other effect that can happen. It's like, I'm going to kill people, and then I'm not going to go to jail. Wait, what? <laughs> it's just uh... not going to happen. Um, so... Verse nine: Whoever has a bountiful eye will be blessed. Now, what that means, bountiful eye, means you, you're you're um, um, what's it called? When you're give to other people, what's it called? Uh, generous. Sure. Yeah. What, is that what it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you're generous with people, there's a good word. I, I thought that that was. Here it okay. Yeah. And that sounds pretty stupid to me that I didn't figure that one out. Shame on me. Uh, yes, generous is the word that I was searching for. For some reason, when you said it, I thought, that doesn't sound right. And I was like, wait, no, that is right. So anyways, whoever is generous will be blessed, for he shares his bread with the poor. Mm -hmm. Drive out a scoffer, and strife will go out, and quarreling and abuse will cease. We were talking about in First Corinthians uh, in, in worship, um, in the worship practice, we were talking about First Corinthians chapter 12, and I, I made this comment. I said, there is no situation ever where somebody is kicked out of a church and it's for the and it makes the church grow better no situation there's th these are your two options when you have to kick somebody out you let them stay and the church is harmed really bad or you kick them out and the church is only harmed a little bit because god says this he says that he appointed people to the church and he says that he, he established them and that they are all the body that means if you have to remove a nail from your foot for instance it's not growing right it's ingrown or whatever. And you have to remove it. That's not for the. It's not for the betterment of the church. Right. It just stops any further harm. You understand the difference? Yeah. So then, as that applies to this, um, what verse was in? Uh, tw tw Ten. When somebody gets to the point where you do have to have to uh, have to drive them out, it's not something you should do with this attitude. They deserve it. They're getting what's coming with them. I'm just tired of dealing with them. Because there's no situation where that is makes things good. It just stops the harm from happening. Understand the difference. Because there is a very real difference. So drive out a scarf and strife will go out. And quarreling and abuse will cease. You still have, there still will be those times when you do have to make hard decisions like that. Just don't make them flippantly. You understand the difference? You have to make hard decisions. Everybody has, made, has to make hard decisions. But think them through before you make them. Uh, he who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. I think this one's kind of 
speaks for itself, but I went ahead and wrote this down. It's the idea of talking with tact. And later on, he's going to talk about someone who who's, has great skill um, and how they're going to work for the king, but I'll get in that in just a second. Um, and how your tact will, will have good effects. Think about Billy Graham, for instance, who was able to counsel and get good positions um, with the presidents for many of them. Uh, I believe both Bushes, uh, Clinton, Reagan? Okay. Uh, do you know, was he there for Obama? I forgot. I think so. Franklin Graham. Franklin was? He's already stopped at that point? Okay. Uh, it, well, because he's gotten so old now. I think he's like 90-something. He's like 97. 97? Oh, Yeah. And that would be why Franklin took care of it. But Let's just say the, the apple fell down and then it rolled down the hill and then <laughs> splashed into a water that washed it down to another continent. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I guess he means well. It just, it's not yeah, well. He's got to definitely get a different persona. Yeah, you know, and he he personifies everything that I've been having to work people through with about the whole America being God's promised land and everything and uh, just so many different yeah. things. It's like, do you even read this? And then you talk so much about reading it and it's like, but do you though? Yeah. Uh, anyways, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm getting off that soap. I'm moving on. Um, the eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge, but he overthrows the words of the traitor. And the idea here, guys, is that God himself vindicates truth. God is not a neutral observer. You may, you may feel like there's no righteousness, or, but every act of injustice is held accountable to God by God himself. See what he just said? Um, the eyes of the Lord keep watch over a knowledge, but he th overthrows the words of the traitor. I don't like this phone. It doesn't give me my little note that says shut up. It doesn't, it doesn't have it. It just tells me that it's time. Um... The sluggard says, there's a lion outside, I shall be killed in the streets. And the idea here is that lazy people always find excuses for why they can't work. Yeah. I'm not physically well, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too rainy. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, uh, I can't get to work today. I, I'm busy. I'm busy. Yeah. Uh, the idea is that lazy people will always have an excuse. And that's the idea here. The sluggard says, there's a lion outside, I should be killed. I have to stay inside. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, the mouth of the forbidden women is a deep pit. He with whom the Lord is angry will fall into it. And this one confused me. I was like, Hwah! and the idea is this: a rebellious person who who can't be told what to do when when when, when they rebel and they reject God's um, God's commands. God's command. Okay, it's like this. I saw a picture of it. Um, there was this guardrail over a cliff, and this guy was jumping over, and he said. Uh, you, uh, I'm gonna live my own life, and then the guy, the other guy, was standing on, on the right side of the guard, and he said, "But you don't understand. It was for your own benefit, and it was a sheer cliff." And that's the commands of the Lord. It, it's it's something where it's for our good being, good well being. But then when we disobey that, thereby incurring the wrath of the Lord, um, we uh, we fall deep into the pit. For instance, of a, of a forbidden woman, we fall into adultery. We fall into those things because God's commands were meant to keep us from them. They were meant to be a uh, protection around us. Um, verse 15, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Children need help in learning, growing, and maturing. Mm -hmm. You can't just leave a child to their own... To their own what is it called? Um, to their own... Uh, what? Devices. Yes! Yeah. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yes, you can't leave a child to their own devices and just expect for a good outcome, outcome to come out. The idea is that we're born into sin. We ourselves are sinful, and we kind of figure out it on our own. Should I listen to Mommy when she said that, or should I just do what I want to do? Let's see if she finds out. Oh, she found out. <laughs> see what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Can you tell that Mike had tore a book earlier that, Mike, that Gracie was kind of upset about? Can you tell from my example? And the, I stopped getting my nephew's books because they would just destroy them. Huh. It made me so mad. <laughs> yeah, all the books now are in my office, and they can only he can only touch it if I'm there reading it to him. Otherwise, he can't go into my office. Problemo solved. <laughs> uh, anyways, 
Uh, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. The idea is that discipline, teaching your kids, is an absolute essential for them to grow up and be someone who's not a fool. Uh, whoever whoever uh, oppresses the poor and increases his own wealth, or gives the rich will, or gives to the rich, will only come to poverty. And the idea here is that it's pointless. Um, if you oppress the poor, if you try to extort people who are already poor, you're not going to get anything from it. You're not going to gain much wealth from that. Um, and then secondly, if you try and, and uh, increase your wealth by giving to the to the rich, that's not going to do anything either. How's that going to benefit you? Excuse me. And uh, verse 17 through 20 then is a, is a united... Uh, what? Yes, 21. Is a did I say 20? I meant 21. Sorry, guys. Is a united uh, front, and it kind of introduces um, uh, these these things that come afterwards through verse 22 all the way through chapter 20, um, 4, verse 22, I think. Yeah, and then 20, verse 23, 20, chapter 24, verse 23 goes into the intersection. Uh, but we'll just go through chapter 22 tonight. Um, and so, in summation, the things that it says in 17 through 21, it will be pleasant if you do this. Uh, you will uh, you will trust God. It will counsel you that you will not know how to respond. So, pay attention to those things as I'm reading through it. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise and apply your heart to my knowledge. For it will be pleasant if you keep them within you, if all of them are ready on your lips, that, you, that your trust may be in the Lord. So, this is the effects of uh, applying your heart to the knowledge, okay? That your trust may be in the Lord. I have made them known to you today, even to you. I have not written for you. Th I have <laughs> not written for you thirty things of counsel and knowledge to make you know what is right. Did I say that right? Have I not? I knew that didn't sound right. Have I not written for you thirty things of counsel and knowledge to make you know what is right, right and true, that you may give a true answer to those who sent you? So these are the things, the, the effects of, of that knowledge. It will be pleasant for you. You will learn to trust in God. It will counsel you, and uh, you will know how to respond. So verse 22, that brings us to the next section here. Do not rob the poor because he is poor, or crush the afflicted at the gate, for the Lord will plead their cause and rob of life those who rob them. And the idea here is that God sees those who are persecuted. Do you know that Exodus says this happened, okay? It, Israel was being persecuted in, in, in the land of Egypt. And you know what it says? It doesn't say that they called out to the Lord. It says that they cried out. To who? Nobody in particular. They were just whining about their circumstances. But it says this in the very next verse. And God heard them. The idea is that this. God watches over the oppressed. And that's a major theme throughout all of scripture. I mean, literally, the whole thing. And uh, so anyways. Um, for the Lord will please them, plead their cause. So then in verse 24, Make no friendship with the man given to anger, nor go with the wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in his snare. This one's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. You become like who you hang out with. Paul said it like this. Um, you are what you eat. No, that wasn't Paul. <laughs> um, he said... Uh, um, uh, <laughs> You know, about bad, poor company, company corrupts, bad, bad company corrupts good morals. That's how it yeah. is. Um, which I think he quoted from somebody else, so, you know, he's a, just a plagiarizer anyways. <laughs> it's, it's a joke, guys. Um, verse 26, Be not one of those who give pledges, who put up security for debts. This would be some, uh, um, somebody who, who loans people money. Okay? Um, if you have nothing with which to pay, why should your bid be taken from under you? Goes against the loan payment. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, be not one of those who give pledges who put up security for debts. So, the idea is in this in the ancient world, there are people who would um, take out loans, and there'd be other people who would put up pledges. I will pay this. Someday, sometimes you give a pledge for yourself, I will pay this, or you, you put up a pledge for somebody else. If they default, I will pay this. But then he's saying, you can't really depend on the future. What should happen if you couldn't pay it somehow in the future? Why should your bed be taken from under you? We see this happen with, with Judah when uh, when they lived in the land of Canaan before they went to uh, went to Egypt in, in the book of Genesis. Um, Judah goes and hires this prostitute, and she says, what will you give me as a, as a pledge? And he says, I'll give you this staff, and I'll give you this thing, and this here, and then I'll bring back by a sheep for you. Or a goat or something like that. I forget what. And it turns out that it was actually 
incest alert, it was actually his, his daughter-in-law, twice his daughter-in-law. Supposed to be three times his daughter-in-law. Long story short, he didn't know. And so then when she got pregnant, he was like, oh, get rid of her. Thank God I don't have to have my, my last son marry her. And then she says, oh, but you're the father. And he says, oh, I'm the one in the wrong. <laughs> That, that's a good example of how they would use pledges. Um, so anyways, verse um, 20, probably 7 somewhere. Let me see. Yeah. Uh, no, 8. Do not move the ancient landmark that your fathers have set. Uh, this would be... Um, I'll just go ahead and boop. God owned the land. So any idea of stealing the land from your neighbor wasn't just stealing your land from the neighbor. It was breaking God's law. And it was stealing the land from God. And so you had this threefold cluster cuss of <laughs> breaking the law, and it was just a terrible thing. So it was even more important here than in other nations. However, um, this was actually a common uh, law in a lot of the other nations, uh, in the Mesopotamian plain and in, in Egypt and whatnot. Uh, but if you're interested in that, I can give you the names of different uh, law codes and whatnot. You can look that up for yourself. Um, and the idea here is that they would have boundary markers w marked w with different rocks and stones and whatnot, and um, you could technically move that when somebody wasn't paying attention, for instance. Let's say, let's say, for instance, you have this neighbor who the father dies and the son's not really acquainted with the land. You move the land over, the marker over, and hey, look, you have more land. Oh, no, your marker's over there. It would be the equivalent of modern day putting your fence over onto your neighbor's yeah. yard. The modern day equivalent of that. <laughs> um, but yeah, okay. Uh, so you'd be trying to seize their land. Do you see a man... And also, it, it's kind of another idea here hinted. Not, um, let's say you're rich and your neighbor's poor. And so you try and dishonestly seize his land. Kind of implies toward that, too. So anyways, uh, do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. This is the verse I was talking about earlier. And the idea here is obviously that, that your work, um, you know, your, your well work gets you places. Um, now, something that's imp increasingly important is, you notice how he said specifically, uh, have I not written to you 30 sayings? This contrasts with an Egyptian um, proverb section, whatever you want to call it, called the Instruction of Amenemet. Okay? This was written sometime around 1100 BC and has a lot in common with Proverbs. I mean a lot in common with Proverbs. As does a lot of things in the Bible. For instance, did you know that when Moses' mother put him in the basket and put him in the water, that that was actually an ancient Mesopotamian story from a guy named Sargon the Great? That's how he claimed that he was uh, born, that his mother put him, in, put him in a basket and left him in the water, and then the, the water god Aki drew him out. And there's a bunch of these little references throughout the Bible where it seems like the Bible is strongly influenced by the culture, which is our question of the week. The Bible clearly has some connection to ancient liter literature of the time. How do you feel about this? What are your thoughts? So that's the question of the week. I want you guys to think about this. Do you think that that takes away from the inspiration of God? Somehow it makes it less? Do you think that that further proves that, it was, written, that it, it was written by God? Do you think that that discredits the message of the Bible? Because remember, these stories were written before the Bible. The instruction of Amenemet, that was written in 1100. Proverbs weren't written until 900. That's 200 years later. Moses was in the 1400s, earliest, and Sargon the Great, I don't remember. I want to say it was 1700? Wait, no. I don't remember when Sargon the Great lived. I would probably guess somewhere around 1800 or 2000 or 2100, something like that. What were you going to say? Oh, I don't know, guys. I completely forgot when Sargon the Great was. So you can Google that if you want. And uh, anyways, and uh, so just think about this. How do you think that, that affects the Bible? Do you think that the message of the Bible is maybe too literally taken, not literally enough taken? Think about this. I want you guys to, to. I want you guys to struggle with this because it's a fact that's there, and this is how people have traditionally handled it. That proves that the Bible is just a product of mixing, combining myths that existed long before. None of it is actually true. How do you feel about that? Do you think it's just a combination of myths that were taken from the areas around? Do you think it's something unique? Do you think it's inspired by God, or just people writing down things trying to fit God into it? What do you think? 
Okay, that's a question of the week. And uh, if there are no questions, we're going to stop there. Questions? 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 Okay, cool.